We've checked out plenty of Micah's lenses in the past and have always been pleasantly surprised with their performance given their low cost compared to the rest of the cinema lens market. Well today we are finally checking out three focal lengths of their Super 35 T2.1 Cine lens set, the 35, 50 and the newly released 75mm. But are they any good? Let's take a look. Currently there are only three focal lengths available in the Super 35 set, but Micah will eventually be releasing an 18, 25 and 100mm T2.1, which will really complete the set. However, the three current lenses available are a pretty solid set for anyone wanting to jump in now. Current pricing on the available focal lengths puts them at a really unique price point for Super 35 Cinema Primes, at just £465 excluding VAT, or roughly £560 including VAT. This positions them as one of the most affordable sets of PL mount cinema primes on the market. These lenses are available to purchase on either PL or EF mount, and this surprised me as their full frame line of cinema lenses are available in a range of different mirrorless mounts as well. Physically, all three of these lenses are exactly the same size, and all weigh in at 910 grams for the PL versions that we have here with us. This is pretty damn impressive, given the slight differences in optical design and focal length. This means they all feature the same 77mm filter thread and 80mm outer diameter for clamp-on matte boxes. They all also come with a detachable support foot for use with a lens support system. They all have the same 0.8 pitch focus gear and iris gears, as well as consistent positioning across the set, which means when you swap lenses you won't have to change the position of your gears if you are using a follow focus system. They also all have the same 270 degree focus rotation which is incredibly smooth. The mechanics and overall build of these lenses is incredibly impressive given their low cost. Where the lenses do differ are their optical designs, close focus, and the number of iris blades that are used. All of the close focuses are pretty good for their focal lengths. And while the 75mm has a 13 blade iris, the 35 and the 50 both have 11. Though with their shape and amount, this isn't really super noticeable when you look at bokeh stop down side by side. The lenses feature a dual scale with both feet and meters, though these markings are only on the left hand side of the lens. How accurate your marks are can be incredibly important if you are using cinema lenses in their intended workflow, with a crew pulling off of distance and marks instead of just visually on a monitor. Out of the box, our copies of the lenses were out slightly. On our projector, 5 foot away from the wall, to achieve sharps on our chart we needed to be at roughly a foot over on the marks. Micah does sell shims directly from them, so if you need a bang on focus scale and want to correct it yourself, this is something that you can do. However, for people not using the marks very often, you will still be able to hit infinity fine and use the lens as normal pulling off of a monitor. When it comes to light coverage, the three lenses do differ slightly. All three are designed for Super 35, however, they can actually cover more than that. The 35mm has the smallest image circle out of the bunch, and that isn't surprising as longer focal length lenses often have larger image circles than wider focal length lenses. The 35mm does show some hard vignetting when used with wider full frame sensors, such as the Vista Vision sensor in the V-Raptor 8K. However, with a more common 36mm wide sensor, such as the 4K DCI mode in the FX6, it gets close to covering but it still has some vignetting in the corners even when stopped down. The positive we can take from this though is that the 35mm covers its intended Super 35 formats extremely well with minimal light loss towards the corners. The 50mm and the 75mm are able to cover full frame, however there is a little bit of vignetting towards the corners on the Raptor sensor, however it will cover the FX6 in 4K DCI mode no problem with only some light loss. The 75mm actually managed to cover the Alexa 65 in its 5.1K mode, which is pretty impressive for a Super 35 Prime. Though I would be intrigued to see how funky the corners of frame get here though. Overall this performance is pretty impressive for a set of primes designed for Super 35, but let's take a look at how the actual image looks across them. We managed to shoot some quick images with the micas in our studio. These examples were shot on our Red V Raptor in a mix of its Super 35, 6K and full frame 8K modes and were lit with a range of different fixtures. Let's take a look at them.
when it comes to bokeh, we wanted to test the lenses on a full frame camera to see how the lenses perform outside of their rated image circle. So we grabbed one of our red V Raptors and shot some tests with the camera in its full frame 17x9 mode. The sensor is actually a good bit wider than full frame, so we did expect to see funkiness towards the corners of the frame. Starting off with the 35mm, we know from our coverage test that this lens won't cover the sensor in its full frame mode, and we can see this here. Wide open, we can also see that bokeh becomes incredibly misshapen towards the corners of the frame. However, if we bring up a Super 35 crop of the Raptor sensor, we can see that bokeh is decently shaped when used within its rated image circle, though it does still have some distortion to it. I would even say that the lens performs well enough for most within the full frame of what an A7S III FX3 or FX6 will see, though there is a touch of cutting, but this could look vintage or different in some users' minds. However, if you want more consistent performance, you'll need to shoot with these on a Super 35 camera or in a Super 35 mode. Looking at the more general performance, if we zoom into the image, we can see that the bokeh has a slightly defined edge with some detail in the out of focus highlights. It also has a tiny bit of color around it, which stays even stopped down to T5.6. Wide open, even in the middle, you can see cat's eye shaped bokeh. This is gone when you stop down to T2.9, and here shape is good, but it's not perfectly circular, as you can see the blades forming the shape of the circle. And this stays consistent as you stop down to T5.6. The 50mm performs better than the 35mm with less cutting towards the edges of our frame here. However, you can still see some pretty heavy distortion of our out of focus highlights, especially when you compare the shape to the ones towards the edges of the Super 35 frame. However, as I said, with the 35mm, this performance in the corners could be considered imperfect, which some people may like. And I actually think performance here is pretty acceptable for even the VistaVision sensor in the Raptor. And for a more common 36mm width full frame sensor, performance is easily acceptable. However, you can see a difference when we compare our full frame 50mm Mica Prime to the Super 35 one. The full frame actually looks to be a slightly longer focal length, but only ever so slightly. And while performance is slightly better than the Super 35 towards the corners of its frame, it still does have some cutting really close to the corners of frame. In regards to the more general look of the bokeh, it is incredibly similar to the 35, but I would say it has a slightly less defined edge and much less texture to it. 75mm by far has the best performance for full frame use here. I have seen plenty of teleprimes like this designed for full frame that perform very similar to it. Wide open we can see cat's eye bokeh across the frame, which gets better as you stop down and a T4 is pretty much gone. Stop down at T4 onwards, we can see a little bit of cutting towards the corners. This isn't as major as on the other two focal lengths. It's also very clean with almost no color around the edges of our out of focus highlights. No texture and a slightly less defined edge. This is consistent as you stop down. Overall, the three lenses look pretty similar when it comes to bokeh, which is exactly what you want when you are buying into a set of cinema primes. Consistency is something that people pay thousands for, and getting it at this price is pretty damn awesome. During these tests, we actually run into a little issue with the 50mm. It was flaring weirdly with our 600D key light. This must be an issue that Micah have seen before release, as the 50mm comes with an included hood, but the other focal lengths do not. Adding this little hood fixes the issue with the flare, but let's take a look at the flare performance across all of the lenses. How a lens's flare behaves is an incredibly subjective thing. Some may like, and some may not. For these examples, we grabbed our Aperture LS60D and blasted it down the barrel of each lens. Keeping the camera and the light in the same place, we can see that the flare is slightly different across each lens. The 75mm has a milky cast across the frame, but this is improved as you stop down. You can also see some slight rainbowing here too, which is a character that the other two lenses show as well. With the 50mm, we did one using the included hood and one not. The hood removes the flare here, but doesn't change the light hitting directly down the barrel. This has a heavy rainbow flare with some others coming off of the light as well. The 35mm is kind of a combo of the flares from the previous two, as it has some veiling glare and some rainbow flaring. Here are some quick shots of us stopping the lens down and panning around a bit to get an idea of how the flare looks. When it comes to distortion, all three lenses perform incredibly well. The 35mm has a touch of barrel distortion, the 50 has almost none at all, and the 75 has a tiny bit of pincushion distortion. This performance is great and is so incredibly minor that you will probably not notice it while shooting. If you have watched any of our previous lens reviews, you will have often heard the word breathing. 
Breathing is a term used to describe the slight focal length change that can happen when moving through a lens's focus range. It's a characteristic that is common in still lenses as it is something that will not be noticed when capturing a single frame. But with moving image, it can be seen as distracting. So most cine lenses are optically designed to minimize focus breathing. However, like a lot of optical imperfections, this could be a desired effect in some situations. When it comes to the performance of these three lenses in regards to breathing, they are all pretty fantastic. If we look at our chart tests here, we can see that there really isn't too much movement while focusing. This performance with the price is incredibly impressive. They perform better than some lenses I've tested that are over 10 times their price. If we look at the lens's ability to resolve our test chart, we can see that the 35mm performs really well. Performance is solid in the middle of the frame, even wide open. As you stop down, it does improve overall contrast, but there still is a touch of CA throughout the T-stop range. At the corners of frame, you can see a difference as you stop down. Wide open at T2.8 look very similar with slight improvements in resolution and similar levels of chromatic aberration. However, when you hit T4, it's quite a large difference. You can see an improvement in resolution, ghosting and CA, and this is even better at T5.6. This is a similar story with the 50 and the 75mm as well. Although I do think the 75mm is the best performer out of the bunch, and you can see this in the centre as well as in the corners. It resolves really well, wide open in the centre especially, but does still improve as you stop down. It's quite surprising how well these lenses resolve and how little chromatic aberration they have considering their price. Honestly, it's really hard to compare these lenses to others, because they are just so affordable in comparison to the rest of the cinema lens market. The only lenses really close to them in price are the full frame lenses from Mica, Irex's Cine lenses and the DZO Vespic primes. Mica's full frame lenses are roughly £320 more expensive than these Super 35 variants. And while the 50 and 75mm can be comfortably used on full frame sensors with a bit of vignetting and drop off, the same cannot be said for the 35. I can see these pairing really well with Super 35 cameras like the Canon C70 and the Red Komodo though, and even full frame cameras if you are happy with the fall off in performance. However, if you need full frame coverage, slightly improved performance, and have a bit more budget, the full frame micas are just as excellent as these. Lenses are an incredibly personal choice, and what lenses you choose will really come down to what you like. Really though, the only kind of downside you could take away from these mica lenses is they're not quite characterful enough, even though the flare is pretty damn wacky. But again, this is all so super subjective, and these reviews are aimed to break down the character of lenses so you can see what you like, what you don't, and make an informed choice when purchasing a lens. So, in conclusion, these three focal lengths in the Mica Super 35 Cine Lens Set are a fantastic option for not only people wanting to pick up their first cinema lens set, but also experienced camera operators and filmmakers who are looking to pick up a set of cinema lenses within a budget. Honestly, these lenses shouldn't perform this well considering their price point. They perform way, way above it. They have smooth and solid feeling mechanics, incredibly well controlled focus breathing, resolve really well, and just overall perform excellent on camera. Let us know what you think of these three Mica Cine Primes in the comments below. And if you like the video, please give it a like and maybe even consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.